Oh, I guess I'll tilt this more towards me. Uh, so I'm a MA student at Carleton University, and I just wanted to introduce my topic because it does build upon kind of what we've been talking about here. Um, I'm much more encroached in ideology, so I just want to preface by saying that that is what I'm talking about, uh, an ideal. Um, so I'm getting into the kind of knit, I'm picking in and drilling on that ideology of a democratic school that's child-centered and why this kind of model appeared in, in the 1950s and proliferated. Um, it became kind of like this one model of a post-war school that became kind of more experimental into the 60s. So I'm just going to begin. So in the fall of 1955, Overland Drive Public School, pictured here, officially opened to the community for the first time. Parents and visitors were invited to inspect the newly constructed 12 classroom elementary school in a ceremony that opened with a rendition of God Save the Queen and ended with refreshments. The building was neither particularly monumental in scale nor spectacular in ornamentation, but a rather simple two-story arrangement of box-like classrooms following a linear hall. Yet Overland Drive's opening ceremony was a publicized event attended by an array of special guests, which included top education officials and board members. The planned program even featured a special guest speaker, Dr. Minkler, the North York Director of, of Education, who toured similar school openings with at least one journalist and a motorcycle police escort. In the 1950s, publicized openings for elementary schools like Overland were not unusual events in the township of North York which would boast the third largest educational system in the country during the post-war era. After its inception in 1954, the Board of Education initiated a vast building program that saw over 100 elementary schools constructed in the borough. School construction announcements often made the news in the Toronto's Globe and Mail, which accordingly declared in the same year as Overland's opening, North York Township leads nation in school boom. Overland Drive was part of the first wave of the suburban building program that established a new elementary school type departing from the older rural model, uh, the schoolhouse and urban monument model. Underpinning this new form was a philosophy that consciously advocated for a specific role for the elementary school as more than just a place for learning. So following the Second World War, education became a key component in the conceptualization of an emerging uh, national identity in Canadian society. Efforts towards reconstruction emphasized ideals of democracy and unity through civic projects and structures embedded directly into the everyday lives of Canadian citizens. Like their British and American counterparts, Canadian civic planners initiated suburban building programs around major cities to address domestic growth, immigration, and economic changes. These communities centered on one building type as a foundational element in the cultivation of a collective and nationalized citizenship, the post-war school. Sunny Lee Public School, the earliest example of this type, uh, which we've discussed, so that's good, we have kind of context there, uh, opened to its small farming community on the western outskirts of Toronto in 1943. Built to replace the township's old brick schoolhouse from 1908, its new design took a striking departure from the typical building of the early 20th century. This rural schoolhouse model, of which the old Sunny Lee is a good example, could no longer meet the needs of its expanding community. Though its square-shaped, two-story, two-room structure featured an impressive steepled roof with a belfry and a chimney stack, tall vertical sliding windows, and a high porch over a stone basement, the structure did not include such modern luxuries as running water or indoor washrooms until 1939. It was eventually due to overcrowding that the community commissioned local architect John B. Parkin for a new school building nearby the old site. John Parkin was not new to school design. Indeed, he previously explored the subject in an article penned for the Journal of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, which I would just refer to as the JRAIC, uh, in 1942, so the year previous to Sunny Lee's construction. In this brief essay titled The Post-War Planning of Schools, Parkin lamented uh, the general lack of architectural development in Canada. He addressed the key parties who he believed held the most responsibility for action in this field, the government, the architect, and the public. He chastised those who employed antiquated practices in construction and architectural tradition, and further warned of an impending post-war surge that would require a new approach to educational design. Uh, in the article, he stated, 
The school building is a result of planning in relation to our educational concepts of a free and unhindered development of man. It should therefore express the type of system which it houses, and above all, the child in his constant development, step by step towards a social life. To realize a happy and healthy environment must be our ultimate aim in school design. To obtain this end, one requires a deep and intelligent understanding of the child and the scale of his world. Like many young architects and planners working in the mid-century, Parkin recognized that the post-war period held tremendous potential for societal change. This culture of reconstruction, defined by historian Leonard Kufert, uh, as an environment and the accompanying complex attitudes, opinions, and aspirations directed towards the achievement of a more satisfying post-war society, these efforts in Canada reflected the nation's ideological principles as well as its anxieties. Demobilization, the trend towards suburban planning and satellite towns, and the introduction of the automobile mass me and mass media with thrust to new patterns of living, moving, and communicating upon many Canadians. Under these conditions, architects, educators, and policymakers would position the school as an exceedingly valuable pedagogical tool in the development of young citizens. It's kind of an idea we still hold. Uh, it's not surprising then to see the name John B. Parkin included in the varied list of architects, engineers, and other professional tradesmen who participated in the Committee on Planning, Construction, and Equipment of Schools in Ontario. Appointed by an order in council on the 28th of November in 1944, this body was tasked to inquire into the planning and equipment of schools, standard methods of construction, standards for mechanical services, and the useful physical life of school buildings. They submitted their interim report on May 28, 1945, just 20 days after Nazi Germany surrendered to Allied forces. Parkin was not the only member of the committee to have engaged in educational design, modernism, or even post-war planning. Chairman Eric Arthur was at this point already at work cultivating a national discussion on modern design in Canada through his position as editor-in-chief of the JREIC, which he held from 1937 until 1959. Arthur also held a position in the University of Toronto School of Architecture as an influential professor. He had begun lecturing on historical and contemporary Canadian design shortly after his arrival from England in 1923 and continued to encourage the development of modernism in Canada until his death in 1982. Other members, such as Burwell Kuhn, James Craig, and Forsey Page, were rather well-versed modernists themselves, each having worked in school design before. The resulting, the resulting interim report was methodical in its study. It outlined the different parts of the school, such as the site, playgrounds, basements, and the general plan, before addressing the basic needs and requirements of a modern school building. These needs included topics such as ideal classroom dimensions, natural and artificial lighting, heating and ventilation, and the standardization of building practices and materials. These issues were worked out within the classroom, here defined as a standardized unit of planning, which accommodated the provincially recommended amount of 40 students, their exits and entrances to the outside and to the corridor, the lighting on each row of desks, the hanging of clothes, and the working space for projects. They offered three schemas, classroom A, B, and C, which included individual coat closets, movable desks for each student, a communal project workspace with a table, counter space, storage, and a sink, ample room for tack and chalkboards, and appropriate heating, ventilation, and lighting amenities for each child. Recognized as a valuable document by architects and policy planners, the interim report marked a new exuberance in school design following the publication. The recommendations were later compiled into suggestions for the layout and construction of schools in Ontario by the Provincial Department of Education, published at least once before 1950 and subsequently updated at least three more times in 1953, 55, and 62. As the only rigorous Canadian study on contemporary school design, um, the interim report was also referenced in the first major Canadian educational review of the century. Uh, the report of the Royal Commission on Education in Ontario, published in 1950. Appointed by Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor and Provincial Council, this committee's five-year-long study began in March of 1945. Commonly termed the Hope Report in reference to lead Commissioner Honourable Justice John Andrew Hope of the Supreme Court of Ontario, the committee drew for, from former research as well as briefs from professional groups and information from international visits. 
The final report was a result of reconstruction policy reacting to societal, economical, and political stresses. Using the same language as those modernist architects featured in the JRAIC and those who contributed to the interim report, the HOPE report expressed the province's educational goals through explicitly architectural terms. Building upon educational psychology that promoted mental health and physical hygiene in the 1920s and 30s, the HOPE report recommended a child-centered approach to educational practice and design. Perhaps best encapsulated by the American educationalist John Dewey and his theories, progressive ideology was expressly fitting in the post-war context. It sought to cultivate good citizens through active teaching practices that met the child's needs. This conception of the emotionally fulfilled whole child demanded that everyone, including teachers, parents, and the broader community, engaged in the social objectives of post-war planning for Reconstruction a product of Reconstruction-minded policymakers who researched and interviewed similarly-minded professionals, the Hope Report states in its opening pages, nations emerging from war have frequently made such reviews. Indeed, there is a direct relationship between warfare and educational development. In war, human effort is stretched to its utmost. Emphasis is placed upon human and spiritual rather than upon materialistic values. And the national awareness, of the virtues of loyalty, patriotism, cooperation, and sacrifice is renewed and invigorated. At such times, man naturally turns to the improvement of education. Firmly seated in this belief that progressive reform could better society, educational policy bridged the gap between progressive pedagogical objectives and the ideals espoused in architectural discourse by placing them in dialogue with one another. In theory, they were complementary. Modern functionalism echoed the concerns of educationalists in physical terms, incorporating new ideas about democratic learning through strategies that focused on the individual experience and its collective effect. The insistence on developing healthy and attractive environments for creative and physical activity was thus ultimately part of an enterprise of nation, an intention to develop well-adjusted and productive citizens that would manifest through the environment. The ideal post-war school, as conceived in architectural press and pedagogical discourse, was thus driven by three core values that would shape its design, health, efficiency, and community. So this brings us back to Overland. Pictured from an angle that accentuates its horizontality in promotional photographs, this two-story building appears as a long, low grid of steel-framed brick and glass planes. Its plan is organized into three parts. An administrative service corps includes the principal's office and teacher's lounge by the main entrance, centralized along with heating and ventilation systems. Also centered in the building is the playroom auditorium, a large indoor space for active use by both kindergarten and elementary age children, whose daily activities are separated by the building's very design. The kinder section is designed with its own washrooms, entrance, and amenities while the classroom hall extends diagonally as a single block. Overland was only one of the many schools constructed in the new and rapidly expanding residential developments across Canada, or Ontario in the mid-century, and Canada. In the post-war era, communities like North York increased in size exponentially, as returning soldiers and their families, as well as new immigrants, moved in mass into these suburban districts sprawled along the outer edges of major cities. Originally founded in 1922 as a rural township with a population numbering in the 6,000s in the 30s, North York had grown by 20,000 residents by the war's end, totaling over 148,000 by 1955, a number which would itself double over the next decade. To meet the needs of its expanding community, Overland Drive was only one of over 118 schools constructed in the municipality between 1950 and 1980. Single-family homes, semi-detached units, and apartment complexes were often organized into these succinct neighborhood districts uh, that centered on, element on the elementary school. Um, and the one that I'm going to focus on is uh, where Overland Drive is, which is Don Mills, very briefly. Described by historian Marian Marilyn McClaskey as the first largest planned, fully integrated, self-sufficient, post-war new community of its kind in North America, combining industrial, commercial, and residential, including educational and recreational facilities, Don Mills was a product of a calculated corporate and civic partnership. Here, the school site 
was positioned by civic planners, architects, and educators as a central component in the social community. It was integrated into the actual urban fabric of each neighborhood unit, conceptualized as an environment where children would not only learn about their subjects, but also about their roles as Canadians, uh, or as citizens within Canadian society. Thank you.